truth. There is contention for ownership. You are either a child of the devil or a child of the Lord God Almighty. And the wonderful thing is, no one else decides whose child you are except you. Now I want to ask you a question. In the last seven days, at any point, could the devil jump up in your life and say, that's my child? Okay, let me ask you another question. In the last 30 days at any point, could the devil jump up in your life and say, that is my child? John 8, verse 44. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. The number one identity of the devil that we all know is telling lies. Of course, we were told of the mission of the devil on earth in the New Testament in John 10 verse 10. His mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. Have you ever wondered how he, the devil, is going to achieve all of these missions? He has no other way but through lies and deceit. He used this same method on Eve and it worked. The lie that he told in the beginning affected the world. That is to let you know the strength that every lie carries. In John 8 verse 44, Jesus was speaking to some set of people in this verse of the Bible. They claimed to be children of God. They believed one could just bear the title child of God without having the qualities of a child of God. Jesus had to make it clear to them what they are. He called them children of the devil because they were filled with the identity of their father, the devil. Biology tells us about genetics and traits. The genetic formation of the offspring can be from the parent. Some habits are transferred through genetics, and also some characters are through the genes of the parents passed to the parent. This is exactly what Jesus was telling the people. They were liars, and the only one who has this identity is the devil. There are no shortcuts to this. There is no way to sweeten this. What Jesus was saying is clear. If you are a liar, you are of the devil. So many people in this world have turned lies to be a normal thing. Some will go to the extent of bearing false witness against someone. Telling lies has become part of human lives, but Jesus is saying it is not right. This is one of the most wonderful things about the Bible and our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells you how it is and doesn't hold. You don't have to be a liar. You gain nothing from it but adoption into the family of the devil. There are no excuses for telling lies. God hates it so much. Proverbs 6 verse 16 and 19 gave us the list of the things God hates. Verse 17 of Proverbs 6 says, A proud look and a lying tongue. Why do you think God hates lying tongue? Simply because it is the trait of the devil. Christians are fond of something we call white lies. It is a kind of lie told to save oneself or not to implicate another person. It is also called the necessary lie. Whatever name you call it, whatever description you give it, God did not give types of lies. He did not give categories of lies. He called everything lies. A lie will always be a lie. Do you tell lies but claim to be a child of God? That is not the trait of God. That is never the identity of God. You 
have to do all it takes to withdraw yourself from the family of the devil. You should not be part of the children of the devil. Don't allow lies to push you into the pit of life. Time to deal with everything that you have to deal with. Has life broken your heart? Have you lost a love? You don't have to suffer in silence. Jesus is only one prayer away. You don't have to suffer in silence. Suffering in silence, in pain in silence, dying in your sin in silence, living with a broken heart in silence, putting a smile on for the world, but crying yourself to sleep at night. This is something I struggle with myself. Even when I am not all right, if someone asks me, I always say I'm fine. But we don't have to live like this. Each and every one of us have been given the ability to call on God. He can end your suffering. He can ease your pain. He can save you from your sin. He can heal your broken heart. He can heal the damage that man did to you. He can heal that damage that woman did to you because he loves you and cares for you. The truth is life is not fair. It really is not fair at times. Not everybody gets the same breaks and the same opportunities. And with life, the burdens and the storms will come. And they can get so difficult that you even struggle to breathe. And life can break your heart in a multitude of ways. Your spouse or your loved one leaves you and moves on with their life. And fast forward two years on, you're still there, left, trying to pick up the pieces. And they've moved on. Your business experiences difficulties through no fault of your own. You went to every meeting, you treated your customers right, you did everything right, and it just doesn't work out, and you're left with a broken heart. Your loved one dies unexpectedly, and you don't know what to do with yourself, and you're left with memories, and a broken heart. Your health gets taken away from you, completely out of the blue, and you're there left with a broken heart. I don't know what's broken your heart today. But there's only one that can heal a broken heart. The one who said, cast your care upon me, for I care for you. Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares for you. He can heal your broken heart. You know, one of the worst things about a broken heart is that it breaks in silence. No one knows when it's broken. No one knows when it's broken. No one knows when it's a break, but you do. And every day, you're wiping your own tears from your face because you have no one else to wipe them but yourself. Some people genuinely want to ask for help, but the words just don't come out. But I tell you today, there is a knock at your door from a man called Jesus who stands at the door. And he says, if any man hear my voice, open the door and I will come into him or her and will sup with him and he with me. Have you lost a loved one? The person who is most precious and near and dearest to your heart and soul. Have you lost a relationship? Have you lost a job? But I tell you today, there is a knock at your door. From a man called Jesus. He says in his words. In 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Casting all your cares on me. Because I care for you. He will hear your cry. He won't turn you away. In Matthew 11 he says. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. People will only be there for you for so long. People will only be there for you for a certain amount of time until they're no longer interested. 
and they will move on with their lives. People will say to you, if there's anything I can do, let me know. And if truth be told, when you need them, they are not there. But I tell you today, there is a knock at your door from a man called Jesus. He will be with you. Even in a year like this, he will be with you. Jesus is a God that gets into your situation. He will be with you in your broken heart, your disappointments, your rejections, your failures. He will get in the situation with you. Have you ever seen Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2? But now, the said the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. He takes ownership of you. Once you let him in, he takes ownership. You are his. You see, verse 2 says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be there. He won't send an angel. He won't send Gabriel. He won't send Michael. He says, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall thy flame kindle upon thee. There is a man called Jesus who stands at the door. Make sure you subscribe to the new line of Judah Prayer Channel. Click the link in the description. The 24 elders. Revelation 4, verse 1 to 5. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. The throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. John the Revelator stands and is looking from time into eternity. He has his feet on earth, but is looking into heaven. This is a phenomenon that is unfathomable us because we are time bound. Eternity is outside the perception of humanity, but John is given the opportunity to stand and look through an open door. But here we see John being invited to enter into the realm controlled by Jesus, and that could have only been opened by the one who holds Jesus speaks to John in chapter 3 and makes his self-disclosing truth. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Heaven is the home of the one who is holy and true. His name is Jesus. After all, we are told in Matthew, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. The only one who can give us the key is the one who owns it. He unlocks heaven for John to see, and then calls him to come inside. By now, John would be familiar with the voice that is speaking to him. He 
had spent the last few chapters writing on his behalf. Undoubtedly, since the narrative in this apocalypse continues, John went up and beheld what will take place. John declares that he was in the spirit as he received these revelations. On a side note, it is important to mention that some are divided as to whether John was talking about being in his spirit or being in the Holy Spirit. I believe the Revelator was referring to the Holy Spirit, since this was a moment of inspiration when God is breathing His divine scripture into the mind of the Apostle. No, John is in the Holy Spirit. He is indwelled by the Spirit of God. As the next few verses unfold, the revelation John received is coherent and orderly. In our passage, John immediately sees the throne and the one sitting on it. He doesn't describe the form or features of the one sitting on the throne, but gives a description akin 